The human species is the product of a long evolutionary process in which the ecological balance played the decisive role. Early human beings were just as aware of the change of the seasons and relationship to the natural environment. Seasonal changes brought different food sources and their great ceremonies were held to coincide with seed time and harvest and the religious observances. Nature was their central focus, influencing not only the natural environment around them, but also their food, water, religious beliefs, and much else of what they did. Many early civilizations were not resilient because they did not observe a balance with nature. A co-publisher in the theory of evolution by natural selection Alfred Russell Wallace is often overshadowed by Charles Darwin, despite being just as important in articulating the theory's importance. Similar to famous naturalists before him, such as Darwin and Alexander von Humboldt, Wallace also wanted to take his naturalist training abroad, and he traveled to Brazil to collect specimens in the Amazon rainforest. However, unlike Darwin, whose chief purpose was to chart the coast of South America, Wallace's primary goal was to discover evidence for evolution. Wallace spent four years in Rio Negro, constantly collecting species, and finally disembarked for home in 1852. Unfortunately, a month into the journey, the ship caught fire, and though Wallace and the crew were rescued and returned home safely, the specimens and his notebooks were lost. Despite this colossal setback, Wallace persevered and embarked on a similar journey to what is today known as Indonesia, this time planning to be away for eight years. Once again, he gathered thousands of samples, discovering species never seen before by Europeans. As he traveled, he noticed the distinct differences of species distributions as he traveled between Australia and Asia. He described the differences as what is today known as Wallace's line, which lay directly on the meeting of two continental plates and accidentally providing support for plate tectonics, though his only evidence was animal distribution. After his return home and his research was compiled, Wallace began to hypothesize about the differences in species that he had observed. He wrote his conclusions in an essay about adaptation and evolution, which he then sent to Charles Darwin, who praised his articulation of the theory. Although both men had the same ideas, it was ultimately Darwin who was able to develop them further and receive most of the praise, though he himself gave significant credit to Alfred Russell Wallace. Oren Lyons is the faith keeper for the Turtle Clan of the Onondaga Nation of the Houdino-Swanee. He is a Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of American Studies at the University of Buffalo and co-founder of the National American Indian Quarterly News Magazine, Daybreak. Keepers of Life, excerpts from an essay by Oren Lyons. So then, what is the message I bring to you today? Is it our common future? It seems to me that we are living in a time of prophecy, a time of definitions and decisions. We are the generation with the responsibilities and the option to choose the path of life for the future of our children, or the life and path that defies the laws of regeneration. Even though you and I are in different boats, you in your boat and we in our canoe, we share the same river of life. What befalls me, befalls you. And downstream, downstream in this river of life, our children will pay for our selfishness, for our greed, and for our lack of vision. 500 years ago, you came to our pristine lands of great forests, rolling plains, crystal clear lakes, and streams, and rivers. 
and we have suffered in your quest for God, for glory, and for gold. But we have survived. Can we survive another 500 years of sustainable development? I don't think so. Not with today's definitions of sustainable. I don't think so. So reality and the natural law will prevail. The law of the seed and regeneration. We can still alter our course. It is not too late. We still have options. We need the courage to change our values to the regeneration of our families, the life that surrounds us. Given this opportunity, we can raise ourselves. We must join hands with the rest of creation and speak of common sense, responsibility, brotherhood, and peace. We must understand that the law is the seed and that only as true partners can we survive? There are maladaptive kinds of resilience. This type of deformed, restrictive resilience is called a rigidity trap, where innovation is suppressed and connectedness is maximal. Another type of undesirable resilience, or maladaptive system, is called a poverty trap. This trap is defined by low connectedness and low potential, but remains persistent. This can occur in impoverished ecosystems, such as overgrazed land or ecosystems that have undergone desertification. For example, export-oriented crop production in deserts, a product of increased globalization, and global food demand has been shown to lead to desertification or the persistent degradation of dry land ecosystems. Approximately 10 to 20 percent of dry land regions are degraded and desertification is rapidly occurring. Most dry land regions are home to impoverished populations in developing countries who are dependent on critical ecosystem services through hunting, farming, and grazing. These populations rank lowest on most quality of life indices, such as infant mortality, per capita income, and human well-being. These social ecological systems are operating in an impoverished alternative state where ecological resilience has been lost and the ecosystem has passed a threshold and transferred into an unproductive state. This loss of ecological resilience forces either human adaptation in the form of abandonment and migration or diminished quality of life and the utilization of various coping strategies. This is not an ideal state, but it is an alternative state of this system and it is resilient through persistence, regardless of future change. However, desertification is an alternate state that is both socially and ecologically undesirable. Part of determining if a system is resilient or not is context dependent and in reference to some ideal or desirable state. Researchers Michael Porter and Mark Kramer have written, capitalism is an unparalleled vehicle for meeting human needs improving efficiency, creating jobs, and building wealth. But a narrow conception of capitalism has prevented business from harnessing its full potential to meet society's broader challenges. The opportunities have been there all along, but have been overlooked. Businesses acting as businesses, not as charitable donors, are the most powerful force for addressing the pressing issues we face. The moment for a new conception of capitalism is now. Society's needs are large and growing, while customers, employees, and a new generation of young people are asking business to step up. In a 2011 article in the Harvard Business Review, a concept in business management that addresses benefits for society are forwarded, called creating shared value 
or CSV. According to Porter and Kramer, the concept of shared value can be defined as policies and operating practices that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simultaneously advancing the economic and social condition in the communities in which it operates. Shared value creation focuses on identifying and expanding the connections between societal and economic progress. culture of waste is most directly seen in our plastic footprint. The same qualities that make plastic a remarkable material also contribute to its challenges as a waste material and a source of environmental pollution. The plastic we find in the oceans may be there largely unchanged for decades or centuries with an impact to a marine ecosystem we once thought too large ever suffer irreversible damage from human activity. As well, the chemical properties of many plastics contribute to risk concerns in highly contaminated environments and in human food chain exposures. A significant contingent of the research community and a substantial body of published research work suggests that human food and water contaminated by chemicals from plastics is a risk to health with linkages to endocrine disruption and a myriad of diseases. That these chemicals from plastics are found in human tissues is now clear, even if the linkage to human disease is confounding and difficult to establish beyond correlation. The future of any oil-based product, like plastic, is certain to be difficult and expensive as a result of a future of declining oil reserves. Many consider the solution is to embrace a cultural shift away from our single-serving, single-use mentality. Establishing a composting program like Germany in the European Union so that bioplastics can actually be composted is a clear choice for communities and for packaging manufacturers. That we transform the cycle of consumption is key, but there is a need for new materials sourced for biodegradation and ease of recycling. And as individuals and communities, we need to recycle. Our own personal choices will help define the advance or retreat from our society's plastic footprint.